Yo, we're back with the War of Art, part three, resistance and its symptoms. Resistance and procrastination. Procrastination is the most common manifestation of resistance because it's the easiest to rationalize. We don't tell ourselves, I'm never going to write my symphony. Instead, we say, I'm going to write my symphony. I'm just going to start tomorrow. The most pernicious aspect of procrastination is that it can become a habit. We don't just put off our lives today, we put them off till our deathbed. Never forget, this very moment, we can change our lives. There never was a moment, and never will be, when we are without the power to alter our destiny. This second, we can turn the tables on resistance. This second, we can sit down and do our work. Resistance and Sex Sometimes resistance takes the form of sex or an obsessive preoccupation with sex. Why sex? Because sex provides immediate and powerful gratification. When someone sleeps with us, we feel validated and approved of, even loved. Resistance gets a big kick out of that. It knows it, ha it has distracted us with a cheap, easy fix and kept us from doing our work. Of course, not all sex is a manifestation of resistance. In my experience, the experience of the author, you can tell by the measure of hollowness you feel afterwards. The more empty you feel, the more certain you can be that your true motivation was not love or even lust, but resistance. It goes without saying that this principle applies to drugs, shopping, masturbation, TV, gossip, alcohol, and the consumption of all products containing fat, sugar, salt, or chocolate. Resistance and trouble. We get ourselves in trouble because it's, it's a cheap way to get attention. Trouble is a faux form of fame. It's easier to get busted in the bedroom with the faculty chairman's wife than it is to finish that dissertation on the metaphysics of Motley in the novellas of Joseph Conrad. Ill health is a form of trouble, as are alcoholism and drug addiction, proneness to accidents, all neuroses, including compulsive spewing, screwing up and such seemingly benign foibles as jealousy, chronic lateness and the blasting of rap music at 110 decibels from your smoked glass 95 Supra. Anything that draws attention to ourselves through pain-free or artificial means is a manifestation of resistance. Cruelty to others is a form of resistance as is the willing endurance of cruelty from others. The working artist will not tolerate trouble in her life because she knows trouble prevents her from doing her work. The working artist banishes from her world all sources of trouble. She harnesses the urge for trouble and transforms it into her work. Resistance and self-dramatization Creating soap opera in our lives is a symptom of resistance. Why put in years of work designing a new, designing new software interface when you can get just as much attention by bringing home a boyfriend with a prison record? Sometimes entire families participate unconsciously in the culture of self-dramatization. The kids fuel the tanks, the grown-ups arm the phases, the whole starship lurches from one spine-tingling episode to another, and the crew knows how to keep it going. If the level of drama drops below a certain threshold, someone jumps in to amp it up. Dad gets drunk, mum gets sick, Janie shows up for church with an Oakland Raiders tattoo. It's more fun than a movie. And it works. Nobody gets a damn thing done. Sometimes I think of Resistance as a sort of evil twin to Santa Claus, who makes his rounds house to house, making sure that everything's taken care of. When he comes to a house that's hooked on self-dramatization, his ruddy cheeks glow and he giddy, and he giddy ups away behind his eight tiny reindeer. He knows there'll be no work done in that house. Resistance and self-medication. Do you regularly ingest any substance, controlled or otherwise, whose aim is the alleviation of depression, anxiety, etc.? I offer the following experience. I once worked as a writer for a big, city, a big New York ad agency. Our boss used to tell us, invent a disease, 
Come up with a disease, he said, and we can sell the cure. Attention deficit disorder, seasonal affect disorder, social anxiety disorder. These aren't diseases, they're marketing ploys. Doctors didn't discover them, copywriters did, marketing departments did, drug companies did. Depression and depression and exa- and ang- depression and ex- depression and anxiety may be real, but they can also be resistance. When we drug ourselves to blot our soul's call, we are being good Americans and exemplary consumers. We're doing exactly what TV commercials and pop materialist culture have been brainwashing us to do from birth. Instead of applying self-knowledge, self-discipline, delaying gratification and hard work, we simply consume a product. Many pedestrians have been maimed or killed at the intersection of resistance and commerce. Resistance and victimhood. Doctors estimate that 70 to 80% of their business is non-health related. People aren't sick. They're self-dramatizing. Sometimes the hardest part of a medical job is keeping a straight face. As Jerry Seinfeld observed of his 20 years of dating, that's a lot of acting fascinated. The acquisition of a condition lends significance to one's existence. An illness across the bear. Some people go from condition to condition. They cure one and another pops up to take its place. The condition becomes a work of art in itself. A shadow version of the real creative creative act the victim is avoiding by expending so much care cultivating his condition. A victim, a victim act, is a form of passive aggression. It seeks to achieve gratification not by honest hard work or a contribution made out of one's experience or insight or love, but by manipulation of others through silence and not so silent threat. The victim compels others to come to his rescue or to behave as he wishes by holding them hostage to the prospect of his own further illness, meltdown, mental mental dissolution, or simply by threatening to make their lives so miserable they do what he wants. Casting yourself as a victim is the antithesis of doing your work. Don't do it. If you're doing it, stop. Resistance and the choice of a mate. Sometimes, if we're not conscious of our own resistance, we'll pick as a mate someone who has or is successfully overcoming resistance. I'm not sure why. Maybe it's easier to endow our partner with the power that we in fact possess but are, but are afraid to act upon. Maybe it's less threatening to believe that our beloved spouse is worthy to live out his or her unlived life while we are not. Or maybe we're hoping to use our mate as a model. Maybe we believe or wish we could that some of our spouse's power will rub off on us if we just hang around it long enough. That's how resistance disfigures love. The stew it creates is rich, it's colourful. Tennessee Williams could work it up into a trilogy. But is it love? If we're the supporting partner, Shouldn't we face our own failure and pursue our unlived life rather than hitchhike on our spouse's coattails? And if we're the supported partner, shouldn't we step out from the glow of our loved one's adored loved one's adoration and instead encourage him to let his own light shine? Resistance in this book. When I began this book, resistance almost beat me. This is the form it took. It told me the voice in my head, that I was a writer of fiction, not non-fiction, and that I shouldn't be exposing these concepts of resistance literally and overtly. Rather, I should incorporate them metaphorically into a novel. That's a pretty damn subtle and convincing argument. The rationalization resistance presented me with was that I should write, say, a war piece, sorry, that I the, rationaliz- the rationalization resistance presented me with was that I should write, say, a war piece in which principles of resistance were expressed as the fear a warrior feels. Resistance told me that I shouldn't seek to instruct or put myself forward as a purveyor of wisdom. That was the- that this was vain, egotistical, possibly even corrupt, and that it would work 
harm to me in the end. That scared me. It made a lot of sense. What finally convinced me to go ahead was simply that I was so unhappy not going ahead. I was developing symptoms as soon as I sat down and began. I was okay. Resistance and unhappiness. What does resistance feel like? First, unhappiness. We feel like hell. A low-grade misery pervades everything. We're bored. We're restless. We can't get no satisfaction. There's guilt, but we can't put our finger on the source. We can't we want to go back to bed. We want to get up and party. We feel unloved and unlovable. We're disgusted. We hate our lives. We hate ourselves. Unalleviated, resistance mounts to a pitch that becomes unendurable. At this point, vices kick in. Dope, adultery, web surfing. Beyond that, resistance becomes clinical. Depression, aggression, dysfunction. And then actual crime and physical, physical self-destruction. Sounds like life. I know it isn't. It's resistance. What makes it tricky is that we live in a consumer culture that's acutely aware of this unhappiness that has massed all its, self, all its profit-seeking artillery to exploit it. By selling us a product, a drug, a distraction. John Lennon once wrote, well, you think you're so clever and classless and free, but you're all fucking peasants as far as I can see. As artists and professionals, it is our obligation to enact our own internal revolution, a private insurrection inside our own skulls. It is this, surpri it is this uprising we free ourselves from the tyranny of consumer culture. We overthrow the programming of advertising, movies, video games, magazines, TV and MTV, by which we have all been hypnotized from the cradle. We unplug ourselves from the grid by recognizing that we will never cure our restlessness by contributing our, in, our disposable income to the bottom line of Bullshit Incorporated, but only by doing our work. Resistance and Fundamentalism the artist and the fundamentalist both confront the same issue, the mystery of their existence as individuals. Each asks the same questions. Who am I? Why am I here? What is the meaning of life? At more primitive stages of evolution, humanity didn't have to deal with such questions. In the states of savagery, of barbarism, in nomadic culture, medieval society, in the tribe and the clan, one's position was fixed by the commandments of the community. It was only with the advent of modernity, starting with the ancient Greeks, with the birth of freedom and of the individual, that such matters ascended to the fore. These are not easy questions. Who am I? Why am I here? They're not easy because the human being isn't wired to function as an individual. We're wired tribally to act as part of a group, our psyches are programmed by millions of years of hunter-gatherer evolution. We know what the clan is. We know how to fit in with the band and the tribe. What we don't know is how to be alone. We don't know how to be free individuals. The artist and the fundamentalist arise from societies at different stages of development. The artist is the advanced model. His culture possesses affluence, stability, Enough excess of resource to permit the luxury of self-examination. The artist is grounded in freedom. He is not afraid of it. He is lucky. He was born in the right place. He has a core of self-confidence, of hope for the future. He believes in progress and evolution. His faith is that humankind is advancing, however haltingly and imperfectly, toward the better world. The fundamentalist entertains no such notion. In his view, humanity has fallen from a higher state. The truth is not out there awaiting revelation. It has already been revealed. The word of God has spoken. Sorry, the word of God has been spoken and recorded by his prophet, be he Jesus, Muhammad or Karl Marx. Fundamentalism is the philosophy of the powerless, the conquered, the displaced and the dispossessed. 
Its spawning ground is the wreckage of political and military defeat as Hebrew fun fundamentalism arose during the Babylonian captivity. As white Christian fundamentalism, fundamentalism appeared in the American South during the Reconstruction as the notion of the master race evolved in Germany following World War I. In such desperate times, the vanquished race would perish without a doctrine that restored hope and pride. Islamic fundamentalism ascends from the same landscape of despair and possesses the same tremendous and potent appeal. What exactly is this despair? It is the despair of freedom, the dislocation and emasculation experienced by the individual, cut free from the familiar and comforting structures of the tribe and the clan, the village and the family. It is the state of modern life. Fundamentalist, or more accurately, the beleaguered individual who comes to embrace fundamentalism, cannot stand freedom. He cannot find his way into the future, so he retreats to the past. He returns in imagination to the glory days of his race and seeks to reconstitute both them and himself in their purer, more virtuous light. He gets back to basics, to fundamentals. Fundamentalism and art are mutually exclusive. There is no such thing as fundamentalist art. This does not mean that the fundamentalist is not creative. Rather, his creativity is inverted. He creates destruction. Even the structures he builds, his schools and networks of organization, are dedicated to annihilation, to the annihilation of himself and his enemies. But the fundamentalist reserves his greatest creativity for the fashioning of Satan, the image of his foe, in opposition to which he defines and gives meaning to his own life. Like the artist, the fundamentalist experiences resistance. He experiences it as a temptation to sin. Resistance to the fundamentalist is called the evil one, seeking to seduce him from his virtue. The fundamentalist is consumed with Satan, whom he loves as he loves death. It is, is it coincidence that the suicide bombers of the World Trade Center frequented strip clubs during their training, or that they conceived of the, their award as a squadron of virgin brides and the license to ravish them with the flesh pots of heaven? The fundamentalist hates and fears women because he, doesn't, because he sees them as vessels of Satan, temptresses like Delilah who seduced Samson from his power. To combat the call to sin, i.e. resistance, the fundamentalist plunges either into action or into the study of sacred texts. He loses himself in these, much as the artist does in the process of creation. The difference is that while the one looks forward hoping to create a better world, the other looks backward, seeking to return to a purer world from which he and all have fallen. The humanist believes that humankind as individuals, is called upon to create the world with God. That is why he values human life so highly. In his view, things do progress. Life does evolve. Each individual has value, at least potentially, in advancing this cause. The fundamentalist cannot conceive of this. In his society, dissent is not only, sorry, dissent is not just crime, but apostasy. It is heresy. Transge transgression against God himself. When fundamentalism wins, the world enters a dark age. Yet I still can't condemn one who is drawn to this philosophy. I consider my own inner, inner journey, the advantages I've had of education, affluence, family support, health, and the blind good luck to be born American, and still I have learned to exist as an autonomous individual, if indeed I have only by a whisker and at a cost I would hate to have to reckon up. It may be that the human race is not ready for freedom. The air of liberty may be too rarefied for us to breathe. Certainly, I wouldn't be writing this book on this subject if living with freedom were easy. The paradox seems to be, as Socrates demonstrated long ago, that the truly free individual is free only to the extent of his own self-mastery while those who will not govern themselves are condemned to find masters to govern them. 
So I'm going to hit the pause button there. The one thing that I'm going to throw a little caveat into was that last part when they were talking about essentially how some people latch on to religion and find an enemy. Um, I myself am quite religious. I think my understanding of that more so from my perspective was looking at the idea of, of the Satan and how most people will look to finding an enemy, finding someone to rally against, and then having everything that come, that stands in their way, everything that, that they work towards, being done with the enemy in mind, the Satan in mind. I don't think that it's necessarily a condemnation of religion. Um, I myself believe that it's something that sort of pushes us all to a better good, pushes us to a, a measure of self-control. And if we don't control ourselves, then we'll find something to control us. Anyway, thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.